Hey guys, welcome to the Brunch and Credit. I'm here with two special guests. My name is Sergio Orzinski, mortgage officer, and today I will be talking about house hacking in the current market. My name is Jennifer Cortez. I'm a credit expert. I'll be talking about credit and credit hacks to help you improve your credit. So make sure you guys stay tuned and I'll see you guys soon. Learn a little bit about you guys. So, is anybody in here a first time home buyer? Awesome. Once there's a late mark, it's there for seven years, right? And it's hard to remove. Not impossible to remove, that's what I'm here for. But. <laughs> so today's uh, class, today's event is about house hacking, um, or at least my portion of the event is about house hacking and buyer's market strategies. A little bit about me. I was born and raised in San Francisco. I moved down here about 17 years ago, it's crazy, 2005 it was a while ago. I went to UCLA, majored in psychology and economics. My wife and I, we live in Long Beach with our cat Momo, and I'm a loan officer. So if you guys have any questions about qualifying for a loan, different programs and things of that nature, you know, let me know, I can definitely help you guys. All right, today's topics, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go into house hacking. Uh, also, now that the market is transitioning from what for the past couple of years was a seller's market into now a buyer's market, um, we're able to actually get credit, seller credit to help us reduce our rate, uh, reduce or cover all of our closing costs, get repairs and things like that. We'll also talk about the 2-1 buy down and how house hacking and different credits can create a situation where you create cash flow you create passive income and I'll set your mortgage. Uh, before I go any further, I know I introduced myself, but uh, let me learn a little bit about you guys. So is anybody in here a first time home buyer? Awesome. Well, and as of tomorrow, you will have owned a property. So congrats to you guys. Yeah. yeah I just want to say that this was inspired because of them. The wow. Credit because we feel like sometimes it's lack of knowledge, right? And lack of information as to why you don't make certain decisions. And after meeting with us, we actually went over the 2-1 buy-down, which is what Sergio's going to talk about. So it's a very powerful strategy, and it's just about how you look at things and how you structure them. But you don't know how to do that unless you don't, unless you have the information. So I, I appreciate them for coming. Awesome. So do I. Thank you, guys. And anyone else that's in here looking to maybe uh, buy a rental property? Is anyone here looking to buy a rental property now or in the future? Awesome. All right. Anybody just here to just learn? Yeah. All right. Cool. That's that's more than enough. That's awesome. All right. That's awesome. All right. All right. The big question. So a lot of my philosophy in real estate and loans and all this is uh, going back to Rich Dad Poor Dad, the book. And Robert Kiyosaki, basically, he just teaches uh, a lot about passive income. But the big, before we even get to passive income, is understanding the difference between an asset and a liability. Because often, oftentimes we'll say, hey, I'll just buy a condo, I'll buy a house, it's an asset. But if you really want to get financially free, you got to get really, really clear about whether you're investing in an asset or a liability. So um, I write here, what is the number one rule to gain wealth and grow it? All right, know the difference between a liability and asset. Liabilities take money out of your pocket and assets put money into your pocket. Okay, so when you're creating, for example, a positive cash flow, you're putting money in your pocket. So now that property is becoming uh, a asset. Same thing with a car, right? You can buy a car and then everybody already always just says, oh, it's, it's a liability. But if you buy that car, let's say your payment's 300 bucks, it's a Prius or something, and then you put it on Turo, 
and it's bringing in 600 bucks. Well, now you took that liability of a car and you created an asset because it's bringing in money, right? So that's just the idea, looking at properties, looking at strategies so they generate money. They put money in your pocket. It's that, it's that simple. Okay, so why, why real estate? Okay, so right now we have a lot of issues in the economy. Uh, most would say we're in a recession. Uh, everyone would say we have an inflation, inflation problem. Inflation is at a 40 year high. It's anywhere between eight to 9%. So that's, that's an issue that the Fed is addressing by raising the rates. And by raising the rates, it makes, makes money more expensive to borrow. If you make money more expensive to borrow, you limit spending and you contract. And that's supposed to you know, limit you know, or reduce inflation. Why is that important to us? Well, you guys, this is one of my favorite charts in all of real estate, okay? If you look at since 1940 as a nation, back in 1940, you could rent out an apartment for $27, okay? So that's not the important part. The important part is the direction of the graph. So from 1940 all the way to 2020, that's 80 years. Pretty much the amount that landlords are charging tenants for rent has gone pretty much up. There's no, not, you, know, you know when you look at the stock market, it'll go like this, or crypto, it'll be like this and like this, but pretty much for the last 80 years, right? So it's not something, oh, it's cool for 10 years. It makes sense for 10, oh, it's good for 20 years. Oh, it's good for, four. no, it's pretty much good for almost 100 years since we've been tracking it, that rent will continue to go up because we have a limited amount of land, limited amount of buildings, and population continues to grow. We, for our population, we're at like 7.5 billion, we're probably gonna hit 9.5 billion in the next 10 years. Some of that will be in the United States, right? So, and the important part about this chart, you guys, is that the rate that rent has gone up has been greater than inflation. So let's say inflation's at 5% for a year, usually the amount that rent will go up is by 6%, 7%. So you're always offsetting the impact that inflation has on, on your financial situation. Any questions about that? No. Okay. So basically, rental real estate is a really good investment. But yeah, that's kind of my, I'm trying to sound smart way of saying, you know, inflation. Or, okay, but yeah, so that's basically what I'm trying to say. All right, so house hacking. What is house hacking? House hacking can be very different to different people. It can be that you get a duplex. It can be that you get a triplex, fourplex. It can be that you buy a four bedroom house and you and your significant other uh, stay in the master bedroom and then you guys rent out the other bedrooms. It can be that you have a detached garage and you guys decide to convert the garage. It can be that you do Airbnb. It can be all these different things. Usually house hacking is a little bit different than just buying an investment property because you're buying it and you're still living in it, but you're generating income from it. So that's kind of the difference. Okay, it's like, hey, well, why not just say it's an investment property? It is an investment, but you're still living in it. So you're either living mortgage free or you're getting half your mortgage covered or something. All right, so basically a little, about, a little bit about me, how it started for me. Um, so I'm not just gonna talk to you about something I listened to on YouTube or a client did. Everything I'm gonna tell you is straight from the heart, straight from my experience. So 10 years ago in 2012, I was 25 years old and I bought my first duplex. I was working at Target and Compton at the time as a manager and uh, I just finished off paying my student loans. I didn't have much because I had financial aid. My parents don't make much money. Uh, so that, that helped me out a lot. So I paid off like 20, 25 grand in student debt and then I saved $20,000 and I bought this duplex. Uh, if you guys know Long Beach, it was in the Wilmore district, 11th and Chestnut. Pretty crazy area, didn't even know, you know at the time. But it was a great investment, bought it for 380000 in 2012. I lived in the front unit. I lived in the, that left part right there. And then I rented out the, the two extra bedrooms. And then uh, my close friends, they were, I think, about to get engaged or something. And they rented out my back house. So basically, I lived mortgage-free from 2012 to 2014. And all that came out of my pocket was 20000 20, uh, I. I didn't, I didn't have really a mentor at the time, even, even though my mom does a lot of real estate in San Francisco. I mean, she didn't raise me, so I didn't really have that connection. Now, now through real estate, we're a lot closer, but I tell you guys this is because that's why I'm standing here right now. 
I didn't know who to go to. I didn't know, hey, should, it's in a bad neighborhood. There's like, you know, there's, I just don't like it here anymore. Does that mean I have to sell? Well, here we're gonna talk about, well, maybe you don't have to live in that property anymore. You can leave it as a rental property. How does that look? Like, where do you get the money so that you can buy other assets? And that's what I wanna be for you guys. Just a, 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 a real, like caring, you know, uh, perspective for you guys. Cause I didn't have that, you know? So I ended up selling it, made like 80 grand. And then, you know, but now I, you know, I sold it in 2014 for like 460. It sold a year ago for like 930, you know? So I, I don't live my life in regret or anything like that. All I can do is pay it forward. Hey, I can show you guys, Hey, well, you know, this, this property actually has a lot of potential. Maybe you don't want to liquidate it. Maybe you just want to use a little, borrow a little bit of money from it and take it to do something else. I didn't understand that you don't always have to live where your investment is. I, I, didn't, I just didn't understand the game. But now that I understand the game a little bit better, I can give it to you guys. So that's why I do what I do. Okay, so that happened from that happened 2014. From there, boom, I upgraded to a couch. No. <laughs> no. So I got, a, I got a house, you know, with that money that I, that I uh, made from selling that duplex. I moved still in Long Beach to a better part of Long Beach, actually where, where Seth's from. The, the Wrigley area, and I love it there, it's bomb. Um, it's a single family home, two bedroom, one bath. So I went from a duplex, all these different bedrooms, all this stuff, to a better neighborhood, two ones. I'm like, dang, now I got the whole payment on me. And I won't ever forget, it was August 2015. Uh, I hit up my boy and I was like, hey, what do I do? Cause I don't really want to have a roommate because I had a roommate for like three months and he had a dog and he's like, I'm a neat freak. I'm like, I'm always vacuuming. It was a big mess. So I was like, I don't want to have any roommates, but, I, but my, my target money is like, it's tight, you know, for the whole payment because I was just me by myself. He's like, oh, well, why don't you do Airbnb? You can get a roommate when you want. I'm like, yeah. And like, and I can make good money. He's like, yeah. So I was like, all right. So then I was like, I don't have an extra bed, but I have an extra couch. So I just took a pic, I swear, I'm not even, I'm, I'm not even lying. I took a picture of the couch around like two o'clock by 435 I already had a booking for 15 bucks no, it's not much money right but it was like oh it gave me, gave me hope so I rented out the couch I had that one an identical couch to the left for 15 bucks two different people and then I was like well I work like 12 14 hours at Target I'm tired that's where my TV so I sit there and there's my TV right there I don't have a TV in my room so I was like man I don't want to rent out my couch anymore you know <laughs> let me get like an air mattress so I got air mattress, this is not the exact one, but you know, I Googled it, right? But I got an air mattress, true story, and I put it in the spare bedroom. That way I can get my couch back so I can watch my, my shows, right? And then I had, man, I got that book quick and I went from 15 bucks to 35 bucks a night on a, on a couch, I mean, on a air mattress. Then, so that went on for a while, then eventually like somebody gifted me a bed, you know, I just, you know, one way, you know, one thing led to another, I got an actual frame and all that. But then I got this which I, in 2020, was able to build. Oh, I, did. I was hoping it would populate the website. Let me see. Oh, no, I didn't do it. Okay. Well, at least you guys can see the picture. I was trying to go into the website, but... Oh, you were able to go to the website? Yeah. Oh, okay. Hold on. Oh, there it is. Cool. All right. So, show all. Or actually, before show all, let me show you guys. Uh, so, uh, you know, originally my house is two bedroom, one bath from like 2015 to almost end of 2019. I had somebody going inside my house through the front door, not, you know, not sleeping on a couch anymore, uh, but walking through and then sleeping in the spare bedroom that for years, either pretty much covered at least half or more of my mortgage. Okay. For, for a long time. And, and I didn't get into real estate till pretty much I got my license in 2016, but I got really, really serious into it in 2017, which it was real tough. You don't, you, I mean, it's like on YouTube, it looks like you make a lot of money, <laughs> you know, selling real estate from the get-go, but it's not the case. It takes some time to build up. So it was real rough, but Airbnb helped me never be late on my payments, not even one time, uh, even though I went months without making any money in real estate. And then, I, and then my property kept growing so what I did in 2019 is I pulled out a hundred thousand dollar HELOC, okay. So I didn't have to ask nobody for money or do and put it on credit cards. I pulled out a hundred thousand and I built with permits a 220 square foot master bedroom. And this is what you see right here, okay. Uh, so it's all fu fully permitted. 
I have a license with the city of Long Beach. It's a business license. They charge me 200 bucks a month. And now I'm proud to say one of my proudest things I've ever done in investing, right? And it's not the duplex, it's not the other rental properties. It's probably that a little bedroom like this, 220 square feet, pays for my entire mortgage, pays for my electricity, my water, my landscaping. I get my house professionally cleaned every two weeks from a spare bedroom, right? So that's my proudest, one of my, probably the proudest moment. And it all started from a couch. It all started from a belief that I can start somewhere and keep growing, right? I can start from the, from the couch, then the air mattress, and then this. So why do I tell you guys this? It's not so you guys can put your couch on Airbnb tonight, but it's just, <laughs> to show you guys, you guys don't have to have a lot of money, but have to have a lot of you know, resourcefulness and think to yourself. And also another thing that no one really talks about is being okay with being uncomfortable. Obviously, you know, I don't have kids, so it's a different conversation. If you guys have kids, completely understand. But it's still, think to yourself, yeah, it's, obviously you guys want things to be perfect, but sometimes things have to be a little uncomfortable. For example, in this Airbnb right now, I don't really see the Airbnbs, but if they're loud enough, I can hear them. And I love my privacy and I wouldn't want to hear them. So something my wife and I, we have to be okay with, okay, we can kind of hear them because it's not separated from the house, right? But it, it quickly leaves my mind when I think to myself, man, if I, I don't sell any, you know, if I don't do any loans, I'm still good. I don't have to worry about my bills because this covers it. So that's kind of the thing. So I just wanted to be real transparent with you guys. I'm a super host. The way you become a super host, I don't think I go into it too much, but you have to get a, um, you have to have someone stay with you a total of a hundred nights. It can be one person, it can be multiple people. Uh, but once you have a hundred uh, total stays, and I think your rating is a, or at least 4.8 and above, you can become a super host. So if you guys are interested in doing Airbnb, I highly recommend is that you guys, um, you know, get professional photography and get bookings as soon as possible because being a super host gets you a lot more bookings, you reduces your vacancies, and you can charge more per month. Okay, so this is really quick, just how the, how the house is set up or the bedroom is set up, real basic, okay? So I know on YouTube or certain Instagrams, you guys see like real fancy ones. Hopefully I'm not blocking, I'm probably blocking, I'll duck. Um, real fancy ones. This is just like bare essentials. It's a full size bed, right? Full size bed. I put a splitter because uh, my ha so my house it it doesn't even have AC or heating. But my, my Airbnb got heating. In. <laughs> it's crazy. I, I know I'm not proud of that, but you know I'm working my way up. Uh, I got a little little kitchenette, little fridge, little TV. So probably all the furnishings. Ah, man, I don't think it cost me more than like fifteen hundred, two grand. So you can even see this is chipped. <laughs> I probably got it used. Yeah, yeah. So it's really, this was gifted to me by a client, the little night thing. So the most expensive thing in this whole thing, other than the build out, was probably the splitter, the AC splitter. But real basic, and it's always booked. And, and then, oh, and the number one thing I can say about it, Airbnb is just focus on keeping it super clean, right? So, like, whoever is your cleaning person, make sure that there's like zero hair, zero anything like I literally um, not not anymore but at first I would she we would she would finish cleaning then she would call me over and then with my hand I would you know if I felt anything like dust or because you can't see dust right so I would literally like that why not not because I want to be a you know you know uh, a asshole or whatever um, but yeah it has a walk-in closet and I have a very small lot too you guys so you don't even need to have a big lot my lot is 3,500 square feet tiny I have a very small lot. So this used to be my backyard. You can kind of see the gr grass area, but now I barely have any backyard. Again, do, would I want to have a backyard for like events? Yeah, but you know, it's, it's, it'll happen someday, right? So. Are sacrificing right now for it, future? Is that it, yes, that's what I want to talk to you guys about. Yeah, of course, I want everybody to have the big mansion, you know, have the beautiful house, the car, all that. If you guys can get it right now, go for it. See, that's the splitter thing in the back. Um, then absolutely, you know, but if not, you know, you have to wait a little bit. And so they don't even go into through the house anymore. So before they used to go in through my front entrance right here. Now they go into the driveway. Right. So, all right. So enough about that. Any questions about, uh, so far the Airbnb? Oh, okay. How, how do I work that? Okay. Yes. Hey. Yeah.
Yeah, not mine because I think mine is very like bare, but like it's really affordable. Um, yeah, I, not really. And it, I think the one way I can kind of combat that if I want it, if I started getting uh, less bookings, I can reduce the limit of staying. So right now you have to stay with me at least three days back to back because I'm the one that does the laundry. I like wash the bed sheets and sometimes I get busy. If I have a different person every night or every two nights, I, I'm washing more. So I can have the cleaning lady do it, but then she charges me more. And then I, I just, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I just want her in and out. Right. So I'm, yeah, I'm very like always thinking about cost and margins. Right. So I'm like, I, I can, you know, I can, I'm right there. I can just wash it myself. Right. But to answer your question, not really. Actually, I get the opposite. Like I have so many, I make so many friends from Airbnb that um, they just like, they want to book with me, with me years later. Like, if you guys look me up, I'm not booked at all. It may seem for the rest of November and December, but I have somebody paying me cash that I trust, and she just needs a place to stay. And so, you know, she's from Atlanta. I'll have her stay. So I've like I know I basically I've had probably 800 different guests since 2015. Like I know a lot of people from the whole world. So um, yeah, I, I it's a little bit different for me because I've been doing it so long. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure. And, and one thing I will say about that is a, lot, a reason it's a bubble too for some people is because a lot of Airbnb hosts have gotten too lax, they, especially with cleaning and especially what, the, what they expect from the guests. Like I've heard, and I've never done this, but you have to do, wash the sheets. Take you have to, I never, no, I've never. To, I, I'm the opposite. Like this, this girl wasn't too smart the other, the other week. And she's like, oh, the controller doesn't work for the, for the TV. I'm like, okay, like, you know, do you think it's the battery? She's like, I think so. I was like, I don't really think it is, but I went to Target, got her some batteries. She's like, oh, it still doesn't work. I'm like, by the way, what color is the controller you're using? She's like, it's white. I'm like, well, it, w the brand, is, it's, it's supposed to be a black controller, right? So she's trying to turn on something else, but I don't think other Airbnb go guests would do that. They'd be like, oh, I don't know, or they wouldn't answer, but I'm answering quick. Like, you know, because I'm, I'm of the belief how you do anything is how you do everything. So if I'm going to answer a client that's trying to get a loan real fast, I'm going to do the same thing with Airbnb. If Steph has a question, I'm, you know, if I can get to it real, real fast, I will. Um, but I think a lot of Airbnb uh, hosts, they, they're riding that wave. Oh, everybody's doing Airbnb. Oh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it my way. And that's giving you just a bad. And so people are like, you know what? I'd rather stay at a hotel. It's probably a little bit cheaper and I get room service and I don't have to do the sheets. I don't have to do their mowing the lawn or whatever BS they're asking me. I don't, with me, you don't have to do any of that. Just, just be, don't be too loud. That's all, that's all I ask. That's all I ask. If you, man, that's, so if you want to know what my worst stories are, I mean, that's, that's a whole different class. But, uh, but like recently, the worst is just that. It's just like it's midnight and they'll be on the phone, like yelling into the phone. It's just like, doesn't make any sense, but oh, just be, being able to look at the, uh, at the reviews real good, you know? Um, so yeah, that's what I talk about, like cleanliness of the house or the room is like the number one priority. That's, that's the way you're going to get real good bookings because I always get a lot of good reviews and they all say, dang, it's really clean. And for me, that, that says something because it's like, that means other people's is not clean. If you're, you're bringing up how clean it is time and time again, that means other people are too lax about it. And then the top amenities you're going to want to have uh, for Airbnb are going to be obviously Wi-Fi for sure. Like right now, I have a guy from Japan staying with me. You know, if they don't have their SIM card set up, they're, they're, they'll be a mess. But they rely on the Wi-Fi, so that's super important. Uh, Long Beach is pretty pretty chill; doesn't get too too hot. But depending on where you get your property, most times you're going to want AC and heating. It's just it is what it is. It's going to get too hot sometimes, and it's going to get too cold sometimes. Be, uh, bed, depending if it's a house, if it's a house in multiple rooms, yeah, a twin size bed is okay here and there. But if it's just one like condo or one room, get at least a full size. If you can make a, a king size happen, that's even better. And then extra towels, at least one towel uh, per person, yeah. Yeah. Do you have that factored in or have you experienced that? 
experienced any of that? No, believe, believe it or not, I've never had a, that ha happen to me. Uh, but again, I have a cheap like model here, right? So even if you're broke, you can pretty much, you know, because I'm cheaper than most hotels. That's another thing, right? Um, but if I do, if I ever saw that, like, it's, it's too much work. So if I did the math and I had to wash bed sheets, coordinate with the cleaning lady, I'm going to make less money, then I'll just take it off Airbnb and book it. Because I've even had a, dif a different person. She liked it so much. She was like, hey, I'll pay you $1,300 for the room. I'm like, all right, cool. That way I don't have to wash bed sheets. But I make, tw like, last month I made 2600 So it has, to, like, my time. Like if So to answer your question, um, if I saw that no one was booking short term, I'll put it month to month. And I'm sure someone will do it. Or I'll put it, I'll leave it the way it is. I'll put it on furnishedfinder.com. I didn't even talk about that in the slides, yeah. but I'm glad you asked me that. A great website, you guys, if you guys are somewhat close to a hospital, it's called furnishedfinder.com. And then that's for traveling uh, professionals, traveling nurses that want to stay with you. And then, you know, because they're going to be working at a hospital nearby. So I would, I would put it in different websites. Like I don't even have mine on VRBO. I would basically look to be more resourceful, put it in more websites or change up the model completely. Instead of going short term where you make more money, I'll go a longer term stay and I make less money, but at least I, I don't have any gaps in, yeah. Yeah, so you make the most amount of money in Airbnb out of all the models, but it's most work, right? Because you have to answer reviews and all that. Um, and it's kind of the riskier one. So a lot of people are now going from, instead of short term, they're going to midterm stays where people can stay for like three months, six months. And you're starting to see that, especially in other, other locations. Even with the, like the economy right now and the rental prices going up, you wouldn't, do, you, wouldn't be, you wouldn't be able to make more money if you did a long-term one-year rental with that at like whatever, 1800 or 2000 or whatever you go in Long Beach. But it's a bedroom. I don't know. Yeah. And, I, and, and, crazy price and then also, I, I sometimes think, well, I also like it because, like, if my dad's going to come down or a family member, they have a room to stay. Like, I, I ran the Long Beach Marathon or the half a couple weeks ago, and I had family come down, and they didn't have to book anywhere. I just blocked it off, and they could stay right there. And I feel so proud that I can, it's just a little room, but, you know, I'm, like, I'm so proud that, you know, instead of them before, they would sleep on the couch. You know, when they would come over, I would blow up the air mattress, put it in the living room, but now they have their own place, they have their own bathroom. It's, like, real decent. Um, but could I make more money? Possibly, but then again, it's just a bedroom, um, so I don't know, you know. I have a quick question about yeah. the, uh, the permit for Long Beach. Like, what, is, like, what does that cover? If you don't have it, what's the consequence? Things like that. I think you have to have it. Have to have yeah, it. it's 200 bucks a year. It's like a business license. And the, what, the, what it covers, I'm, I'm not sure, but what they look into <laughs> it, is crazy. Like, uh, Go, let me show you, let me go back to this picture right here. Um, so right here, they, they looked, okay, so they'll go into your booking uh, online, the city of Long Beach, and they'll look, they'll pull up your permits, and they'll be like, oh, okay, so that's where there's a window there, there's a door there. But they, <laughs> they looked at it so closely, they're like, oh, there's supposed to be a window right here, and there's no window. So like, hey, we're gonna, cause the first inspection, when I first started, they didn't even go inside. And I thought they were gonna wanna check the garage to see if I had somebody in there, you know, or they didn't, nothing. They just wanted to see what I was renting, all right? But then a year later, they're like, hey, we gotta go back because you're missing a window. I'm like, I'm not missing a window, but they wanted to come back. So they're like, yep, you're missing a window. So then I, I said, hey, so wait right there. I got my little briefcase, came back out, you know, and I showed them, look, I got the drawings and there was no window there. Originally there was, but then we decided not to put a window there. And here are the updated ones and it was signed off. Um, so then that was cool, but they caught me for something else. I put a kitchen, the kitchenette was without permits. So, so what, the, what you need to be aware of with the permits is that um, they will look and make sure everything that you're showing is actually permitted. So if, you, like, if you're gonna like rent out an unpermitted area, they may not give you the license for it because they check and they, Check what they have on record compared to what you have advertised. Yes. So let's say you want to do an Airbnb and you wanted to have that spare room for like relatives. Would you need those permits? No. For the kitchenette? No, because no, you're running a business. Okay. Yeah.
On Airbnb? Yeah. Great question. So I just found out because my neighbor built an ADU and all my neighbors know I have an Airbnb because they see all the random cars. So <laughs> they're like, what's going on? So I, I, you know, I'm a cool neighbor. I'm just like, yeah, like, hey, dude, like, and they always see me around. They're like, these guys, like, they give me like weird looks. Like I'm doing like, cause you know, like I, I'll take calls, like business calls, like, and I'll be in sweats outside my house. And they're like, you know, so I don't know what they're thinking. Anyways, um, and they see all these cars, right? So that, so I invite them over and they'll see it. Like all my neighbors know what I have going on. They see it. And then I told one neighbor, um, hey, hey, you should run it. I'll show you how to do it, da, da, da. And he's like, man, I wish, but ADUs in Long Beach are only for long-term stays. Why? Here's a, I think here's a philosophy. An ADU is supposed to help long-term housing issues, right? So like, basically there's a lot of homelessness right now and there's a lot of people that don't have housing. So the idea of allowing a lot of ADUs to, to be built is so that people that can't find housing can find it. But if you put that, that ADU in on Airbnb, well then you're not, you're not really helping people that need housing get housing, they just get it for three nights or a week or whatever. Um, so to answer your question, I, from my understanding, I can do what, I, what I'm doing right now, and if I wanted to, I can even convert my garage right now and rent that out long term. But that would just be too much activity in my house. I'm, yeah. whoa. But I can make a killing. Like, if I, like, I thought about it just for fun. Sometimes I look at my house. It's a, it's a small house. It's like 1,400 square feet. I could probably make, like, close to, like, $65,000, $7,000 off a little house just by subdividing it, by converting the garage, doing a little Airbnb, doing this. I put solar panels so everybody gets free electricity. I already thought about it. And if you guys want to talk about that, we can get crazy. We, we get, so we, I thought about it, but I'm like, hey, I'm just trying to like chill. I'm just trying to have peace. Like, I don't want anything too crazy. Because Airbnb can get crazy, let me tell you that. Back in the day. Okay, so where were we? Um, so yeah, how to become a super host. I know there's a lot of verbiage there. But just focus on uh, respond to everybody. That's super important. Just respond to everybody. Yes, sir. Uh, what have you, from your history, your personal... It's actually saved me a lot of money on taxes, right? So I'm 1099, I, you know, uh, I pay taxes, you know, till the end. So it's actually, so now the way I structured it, I mean, I don't know who's going to hear this, but the way I structured it is basically all my, <laughs> yeah, hey, stop, stop, uh, plead the fifth. No, but basically, yeah, please, hold on, you guys, hold on. Um, all my utilities, my internet. Um, you know, my house being cleaned, all that is a tax write-off, right? Because it's like, what part of my house is using electricity, right? Or all that. So, yeah, dude, my tax basis is crazy. Like <laughs> compared to what I make, it's just. But I just know how to, you know, you know, uh, follow. The, <laughs> you know, re no, I'm just kidding. But um, going back to, so it actually helps you in taxes for sure. Anytime you have a business in America, I feel like. Is if you have a good CPA, you're going to pay less taxes. That's just a rule of thumb. It's not an Airbnb thing. It's just if you own a business because you can deduct different things and then, you know, save some money. But um, you do pay an occupancy tax to the city of Long Beach, and you pay 3% service fee to Airbnb. But I look at it, but it's not even that much. I, don't, I mean, you're still not making tens of thousands of dollars. It doesn't, just a little bit, but you do pay tax. It's still in the green. Yeah, oh, yeah, for sure. Big time. And then you want to maintain a 4.8. But basically, if you guys do Airbnb, uh, you guys want to get it booked um, ASAP, you know, and try to get 4.8s and then have 100 nights. So that's about a little bit over three months of stayings and then become a super host. That's boom. Once you do that, your probability of having a lot of vacancies will go down a lot. They're going to be the first ones hit, right? The people that don't have bookings, that don't have reviews. So you want to get a lot of reviews. And ask them to, please, I'm going to write you a review. Can you write me a review? Especially if they're a good guest. Especially if they know that you're going to write them a good review, ask them to write. Be like, be direct. Like, hey, write me a review. So and that's, how, that's how I've gotten almost 460 reviews at this point. All right, so here's another cool thing. So I have a different property in Redlands um, that's probably, uh, I wouldn't say more profitable than Long Beach, but it's, you know, getting up there. Um, so I bought the house back in 2020 um, during the pandemic. So that's another thing. W whenever people are getting scared, right? That's when you got to jump, right? So everybody in 2020 was scared. I was like, awesome. That's why I'm going to buy a property. I got a little money saved. 
and, I'm, and about the Redlands property. That property is originally a five bedroom, two bath, and then without permits, okay, without, <laughs> without permits, I made it into a seven three. Okay, so the, the kitchen was extra long, so I put a wall right there, subdivided it, made it into a bedroom, and then I converted the garage. And then there was a space in upstairs area and I added a bathroom there. So basically I took a 5-2, made it into a 7-3. The, the smallest bedroom there, like it's pretty darn tiny, I charged 700 bucks. What do you get when you rent for me in one of these bedrooms? You get uh, a very clean home, you get a flat fee. So, so the, the garage, for example, doesn't have its own bathroom, but she pays me 875, right? But I set up like a little, almost like a kitchen area for her. Um, she, everybody that rents there, they, they get washer and dryer in unit. I, I made it coin operated recently because some people start abusing and they just run the machine all day. It's just too much. Uh, I, it's not that I even want the money from the laundry. It's just, I want them to calm down. So it's just, it's just, it's just too much. So I, so I charge a dollar. So you, you put, put coin operated washer and dryer. They get extra fast Wi-Fi. They make sure they ask me for that because they all want their Netflix. Um, so you give them, yeah. So basically all utilities, uh, Wi-Fi, cleaning lady. I have a cleaning lady come every two weeks. So if you guys buy a property out in Redlands area, Dulce, bomb. Like she'll, <laughs> I'm t I'm, it's hard to find good vendors. I'm telling you. So if you guys need my Rolodex, let me know. She, she you know. She makes everything look real clean. So what the cleaning lady or a cleaning man, whoever, uh, you know, you know, uh, does is any common area. So like the kitchen, uh, uh, kitchen, living room, all the shared bathrooms, any master bedrooms, you charge a premium. Like I, so I have a different philosophy about how I charge. If you're like really good, like, and you look out for me, like I don't really raise your rent too much. Uh, but if, I, if she were to leave, she's paying me $875 for the master. I could easily charge $975 for a master bedroom. So it's just, yeah. So I rather, I, I just, I try never to be greedy. I just want it to be passive. I just don't want headaches. That's the key thing. So is you just got to play chess with this thing. Like know when to raise it. Know when you have the leverage. Like for example, you put a bedroom right now in Redlands you know, for, and you say $700, your phone's gonna go off the hook. It's really cheap. Now, if you say, now if you say uh, 900 for a bedroom, it's gonna go crickets. But if you say 900 for a master bedroom, you're gonna get a lot of calls. Everybody wants to have that private, that private uh, bathroom. Uh, but yeah, you can make a lot of money uh, doing room rentals, because think about it, just do the math. Seven bedrooms, let's say, let's say I was renting all seven bedrooms for 700 and I'm not some of them almost $900, okay? And I put solar panels. Uh, and that's a whole other conversation we can have. If you're gonna do room rental, you have to get solar panels. I made the mistake, I just bought them outright. Um, and that was actually a mistake. I would do what's called the power package, I believe, where you basically, you don't own the panels, but like they, if they get extra power, they get to use it. Why? Because, um, you, you know, what if, what if one of your panels breaks down, then you're responsible. You might, like, if it's a rental, I don't, you don't really need to own the panels. But anyways, we can go into that some other time. So it's a flat fee, and I, and I even say recommend you know, solar panels. Any questions about the room rental model? Are you located near a school? Or? Okay, so that's why I thought I had to be, and yes, I am. I'm, I'm walking distance from um, University of Redlands, but no one's a student. I was like, so I, like, I was like listening to Bigger Pockets. I'm like, okay, you got to buy a house. It's got to be near a college or this and that. So I did it, and I don't regret it, right, because, you know, colleges do employ people. But um, I say if you're near an Amazon, like a warehouse or a big Costco, I mean, think about it. So you work at Costco, you're making 15 bucks an hour. And I'm charging you 700 bucks. Like, that's all you have to pay. If you live in that same area, you want to get a studio, you're going to pay at least, let's say, 1,100 bucks. Let's do the math. At least 1100 but just to rent a studio, right? And that's not like Long Beach. No, I'm talking about Redlands, Mentone, that area. About yeah, oh, but let's just use that number, right? Yeah. And then what about your electricity bill? What about uh, Wi-Fi? What about maybe parking is separate? There, I, the property I got, you need, if you're going to do this, you have to buy in an area where there's a lot of parking. I bought it in a cul-de-sac. So there's a lot of parking. So there's always... 
my, my property ha or that property has seven different cars or no, it has five cars on the street because it's first come, first served for the driveway and they can't park in the garage because someone's living there, right? But you have to be in an area where there's a lot of parking. But that, that thing is a cash cow, makes a lot, makes really good money. Okay, so how do you find a roommate? So I'm telling you, oh, I make a lot of money. How does it work? Okay, so separately, if you guys are interested in this model, I have a template of what I use on Facebook Marketplace and on Zillow. All you guys have to do is copy and paste it and change it to your information, right? And then you guys you know, can use it. So you guys don't have to type out, hey, what am I gonna say? How am I gonna attract you know, tenants, all this. And when you guys start posting, and you guys get, you're gonna get a lot of questions, don't, don't engage and don't ask too many questions. Don't ask it where the credit is. Only ask, uh, hi, any pets, how many occupants? That's all you wanna ask, okay? Just protect your fingers from typing too much. <laughs> just, <laughs> just ask the basics. Why are you asking that? Because you do not wanna have kids there. That's too much of a liability, okay? And a lot of people want their room for kids, okay? And you don't want pets. I have nothing against pets or kids, right? <laughs> but well, let's talk about pets. So one time I bent my rule uh, and I have a cat, so I have a soft spot for cats. And the girl was like, hey, I have a cat. And her room was separate from everybody else because I subdivided the kitchen. So she's not even next to anybody, but she uses the same washers and dryers. So she, I guess, washed the whatever the cat sleeps on. Next thing I know, one of the other tenants is like, my eyes, they're like coming out of my, my face. I'm like, whoa, what's going on? And, I, and then in my back of my mind, I'm like, what, what, what happened differently? There's a freaking cat. The lady had an allergy to cats. So it was all this drama. Oh, man, all this drama about the cat, so the cat had to leave. So it's not that we don't like as investors cats or, or dogs, but if you're going to share it, if you're going to have multiple different tenants in one in one, um, one house is too much. Same thing with Airbnb. I had a cat lady again, but imagine the amount of time I'm going to have to use to clean. So right, it's, it's, so you just, it's just tough. It's just tough like that. But anyways, I go. I'm getting off topic. But you just want to use your best ones are going to be uh, Zillow. No, number one is going to be Facebook Marketplace. That's number one to, to get roommates or get tenants in general. Facebook is bomb. It's really good. Zillow is really good. And, uh, and Craigslist is making a, a comeback, actually. I used, to not, I used to hate on Craigslist. I'm like, that's garbage, I'm like, that's ghetto. No, but Craigslist is, <laughs> yeah. No, I used to be, but now I, I'm, I like Craigslist again. Any questions about how to find a roommate or a tenant? I try to say, uh, yeah, because that happens a lot. So um, I try to say that they can't sleep overnight. And I've had to evict some people because it's like, interesting. It's like, the, the, you know, I have my little spies at the house. They're like, hey, like, that's not even, not, not even, not even just a one night thing. It's like, they're there all week. So I'm like, ah, okay, yo, you got to go. Kind of follow up with that. Do you have any cameras on your property that look from the outside? Yeah. They're not working at the moment, but I need to. Yeah, yeah no, I have them out. So it's more, it, it still serves the purpose because they think they're being watched. Yeah, but uh, okay, so that's how I do this, but I'm, I, I'm connected to a lot of like Vietnamese uh, investors and they take it to the next level. They have cameras in the uh, living room, right? And they just do stuff a whole different way. Um, their way kind of works better. I'm a little bit too relaxed. Um, but yeah, the living room idea, huh? I, I don't know, actually. I just, because the thing is, so I try to keep it all the same gender, too. Um, but, uh, okay, let's switch topics a little bit. So when I first started doing this room rental thing, I was convinced it had to be all the same gender. I'm like, because that's weird. Like, okay, we're rooming together. And then you'll be like, hey, what's this dude doing here, right? Because it'd be better if it's all, all you guys. But now it's actually way better if it's like majority women and like one or two guys. Why? Because let's say the garbage can gets too heavy. No, no, true story. This is how I found out. The garbage can got too heavy. It was no one threw the garbage can stayed inside the house. They're like I can't, I can't push it. And I was like thinking to myself, I have to pay a handyman to go push the trash can. Now, ever since I have one guy there, they love it. 
there's a, someone with muscle to move stuff, da da da. So yeah, it's risky. You can get you know somebody that's maybe you know you know weird, but it's work wonderful. They feel more protected. You know, there's a guy there. You know, so it's yeah, it's actually worked out pretty good. But yeah, Zillow, uh, Zillow, Facebook Marketplace, and Craigslist. You'll you'll find a roommate. All right, so this is a cool, awesome plan that I recommend to everybody. So growing up, um, you know, just like everybody, we were kind of taught in schools, you'll get that one house, you become a first time home buyer, and then that program that helped you get that first house is gone. You use it and you lose it, but that's BS. You actually can continue to use it. It's called what I call the 555 plan, meaning you can buy five homes in five years each for 5% down. Now, if you can't, you know, your financial situation doesn't allow you to keep buying homes, it's all good, but it's the idea that you can keep buying homes. Now, the key way to make this happen is that every time you buy a home, you're telling the bank or the loan officer that you're going to move into the house. That allows you to buy the, the house for 5% down. Now, if you're somebody who is okay with moving every so often, Let's say today you bought a two-bedroom condo. You can, you can use even 3% down to get that. And then next year, you're like, man, the condo's too small. I want to get a house. And let's say the only house you can afford, though, is all the way in Hemet, far away. Get a nice three-bedroom, two-bath. Then the following year, you're like, dude, this, the commute is killing me. Then you have another 5% and you want to get a house in Corona. It's a little bit closer. And then the following year, you want to get a house here in Long Beach. You could do that every time a 5% down. It just has to make sense what you're doing. You can't say, I'm gonna buy a house in Bakersfield. Like, how, but your job is over here. See what I'm saying? So that's what they're gonna check, that the story makes sense. Where do you work and where's the property located? Does that kind of make sense what I'm saying about the 555? Five, five? Yeah. Oh yeah, so every time you, do, okay. So, you know, here's a house, here's the first house, you know, uh, that you bought, let's say, in 2021 and then in, this year, 2022, you're going to buy another house. You're going to tell the bank, I'm going to leave this one rented. My mortgage is $3,000. i am going to rent it out for thirty-five. dollars So it actually even helps you that you're going to leave that one rented and you're going to buy this new house. Because they're telling the bank, here's a lease agreement. Whatever, it's, whatever my monthly mortgage is, including property tax and insurance, the tenant's going to cover it. So the key words here are primary occupancy and that the property that you already had is a departing property. You're departing it, leaving it as a rental, the, the cost of it. And even, and, and even if, let's say your mortgage is 4,000, you can only rent it out for 35, you can still, it's fine, you can still get another house. It's just that, that rental income won't help you. It actually affect you a little bit, okay? But you can, so you can buy homes often, you guys, for very low down payment. Because that's the number one reason I think a lot of people don't buy more homes is because they, they feel they have a cash issue. But here I'm trying to, let you guys know that there's a will, there's a way. If you're willing to occupy different properties, you can buy multiple. And if you guys have five properties, that's a portfolio of properties. Especially if you know how to do Airbnb, how to rent them out per bedroom, you can make cash profit. You can have somebody else pay down your note, pay down your debt, and you can make 500, 1,000, sometimes like the Redlands property, $2,000, 20, I mean, I don't want to give false prompt, you know, False hope, but there is ways to, to make you know, some significant cash per, uh, per thing. Speaking of multifamily property, I'm just gonna to touch on it real quick, um, but this is a pretty cool formula. It's called the 4321 formula. In essence, you can buy your first property as a fourplex using the FHA loan. It requires 3.5% down. And then let's say two years later, you wanna buy a triplex, you can use the FHA. So you, would, you, you can only have one FHA loan at a time. So with the fourplex, what you would technically be doing, just to be very clear, is you would be refinancing out of your FHA into a conventional loan and then freeing up your FHA use and then using it to buy a triplex, duplex, and then like that. Okay, so it's, it's a, a formula where you can buy multiple properties year after year using lower down payment. So the 555 has to be a single house. 4321 can be multifamily. Okay. Any questions about that? All right, so things to consider. No, sometimes agents, sometimes people on YouTube, they forget to tell you this stuff, which is really important, okay? 
Um, oftentimes, especially in LA County, you know, San Bernardino County, there's only one water meter. So generally speaking, you as a landlord have to take care of the water, right? So utilities, when you're looking at a property that you want to invest in, multifamily, single family, however it's going to be, look at what utilities you as a landlord would be responsible for. Vacancy, we had a conversation about vacancy. Rule of thumb, you always want to expect one month out of the year is going to be vacant. So when you're running your numbers, expect for one month. And a one month actually can be pretty good uh, because then you have time to go fix things that you didn't have time to. Paint it, maybe add the splitter. You know, I didn't have that for a while. Add amenities so your, uh, your listing can be more attractive. Uh, CapEx, CapEx is extremely important. When you're buying a property, what is the condition of the AC? What is the condition of the roof? What is the condition of the foundation? Maybe you have a tenant in there right now and everything is fine, but you already know because of your home inspection, which you guys should always get a home inspection, that that roof only has five more years. A CapEx is a big expense that you have to budget for because if you don't know how to negotiate up front or you don't know your numbers up front, Oh, you're making a thousand dollar. Let's say, let's say every month your tenant is paying your entire mortgage and you're making a thousand dollar profit. So end of the year, you just made $12,000, but in the home inspection, it says, Hey, you're going to need a new roof and that new roof is going to cost $20,000. So your, your real net profit for end of the year is negative 8,000. Let's be real. <laughs> you didn't make a profit. You, you took the 12 that you made and you took that and you, you know, you had to put it into a roof. So really understanding big ticket. I don't, I'm not talking about painting. I'm not necessarily talking about windows. I'm talking about the, the HVAC and AC, depending on what kind of building you have, that's $10,000, a roof, $20, $25,000. So those kind of exp expenses being aware, if it's an out of state property, you know, most likely you're going to want a, a property manager. That's going to cost you anywhere between, I believe, six to 10% of your rent. Okay. So in budgeting that finding the right property. So a lot of people give the word gentrification, a bad word, you know, make it like a trigger word or whatnot, but basically gentrification, if you really look at the definition of it, it's when people are investing in a community. And uh, my biggest recommendation about finding the right neighborhood is when it's semi gentrified, when it's fully gentrified, it's too late. You're paying too much for that property. So let's say there's 30 markers of a gentrified property. Like there's a bike lane, uh, there's coffee shops, there's $12 ramen, right? Where in the hood, <laughs> in the hood, it's a couple of noodles, like not, you know, a pack of 99 cents, but now they're charging you for the cup of noodle, 12, you know, 12 X, right? Like crazy amounts. Um, when, when you, you know, what else? When you see, I put funny stuff in here, <laughs> like yoga pants, like, oh, in my neighborhood, <laughs> I'm starting to see like, you know, girls running like late with yoga pants. And I'm like, okay, that's a gentrified thing. Cause in the hood, in the hood, you get kidnapped from, you know what I mean? Like, what are you doing? You know? Um, or another big thing is renaming like, um, Houston in Texas. They did, it used to be like part of Houston, West Houston. Now they call it West Ho. You know, so the moment they call it like a different name, it's the same place, but they call it a different name. All you know, it's being gentrified. Right. So looking at things like that, um, but by far the number one thing for a neighborhood is proximity. I would say to employment, the number one indicator if your property value is going to go up is how much job opportunities there are. So that's why Inglewood, right? Inglewood blew up a lot, right? The stadium and all that kind of stuff. So looking for things like that. Uh, but coffee shops are big. If you guys see a lot of those coffee shops, you see the bike lanes, uh, you see like community events. Those are yet it's still not where it needs to be. Those are places that there's going to be more and more people looking to invest in those communities. Imagine where it's going to be in 10 years, right? Wrigley is a perfect example of that. I moved to Wrigley 2014. It was not a long, way. It went a long way. It's just, and it gets, and I see who continues to move in. I see the energy. I see the, the vibes. Um, it's definitely on its way up. That's a property that I would never sell because I think it can only, it can only go. Okay. So a little bit about pros and cons of, of the market right now. So rates right now are the highest they've been in 20 years. That's a fact, they're really high. Uh, they're more than double what they were in January. All right, so in January, you could probably, let's say you could have got 3% interest rate. Now you're looking at about a 7%, seven and a quarter. So more than double, that's not, that's, no one would have predicted that rates would be this high that fast. And they're gonna meet, the Federal Reserve is gonna meet in November, and it's almost for sure that they're gonna 
they're going to increase it again. And their increase does not necessarily have an immediate effect, but it has a big influence. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how it works. So that, that's the bad news. The good news is a lot, of, lot there's a lot of good news. And <laughs> is that, uh, you know, in 2020 and 2021, if you're going to buy a property, it's uh, the first thing coming out of the agent's mouth, highest and best. I'm like, oh, okay, hey, how you doing? I'm Sergio, what's going on? Uh, highest and best, okay, all right, you know? So they keep repeating highest and best, as is, I got 20 offers, all this and that. So that was definitely not a buyer's market. That was a seller's market where they just want the biggest dollar amount. But now you can get sellers more likely to pay for closing costs. Okay, that's a very big deal because anytime you're going to buy a property, you're going to put the down payment, whether it's going to be the 3.5% down, the 5% down, and then you're going to have your closing costs, right? Um, also, the seller may pay for a rate buy down. So rate buy down, let's say today we quoted you at seven and a quarter percent. You can ask the seller to permanently buy down your rate. So instead of it being seven and a quarter, it's going to be six and a quarter. That that's, that's happens a lot. I see it every week that I'm in a deal. I, I see it a lot. Or, so here, here's two schools of thought. One school of thought is it's going to be a long time till the rates go down. Right, so then you're gonna to wanna to do a rate buy down because you don't know if it's gonna take five years, 10 years, you don't know when the rates are gonna go down. That's one way of thinking about it. And, and your guess is as good as mine. I don't know when they're gonna go down. Um, or you think, like I think actually, that the rates will go down in the next three years, at most five years. Why? Because there's probably gonna be a new president. There's gonna be probably a new administration. And whenever you get a big political change, somehow magically gas prices go down. Somehow interest rates go down. And then that person is the best thing since sliced bread. Wow, man, I'm the best. I'm the best ever. Because they do this and, and people are like, wow, that person knows how to lead the country and all this. So I have a feeling, I don't put, you know, I'm not gambling. I, I, I don't know. I just have a prediction that in the next three years, at most five years, rates will go back down because rates are cyclical. And if you believe like I do, then maybe instead of doing a permanent buy down, leveraging a 2-1 buy down would be better. What is a 2-1 buy down? A 2-1 buy down costs you $0 as a buyer, as an investor. That money has to come from the seller. So it does not cost you anything, okay? What that does is, let's say today, let's use round numbers. Today you're rated 7%. For the first 12 months, 2, one, two buy down, right? So the first 12 months, your rate will be 5%, right? Seven minus two is five. Then from, uh, for the second year, your rate will be 6%. Because the first year you buy down by two points, then the second year by one point. Then starting the 25th month, right? After the two years, then your rate goes back to today's rate. So in reality, in your loan docs, it's gonna say you're locking in a 30 year fixed 7% loan. But right below it, with a 2-1 buy down where for the first year, your rate is 5%, your second year, your rate is 6%. I get this question a lot, which one's better? Uh, it depends on you. When do you think the rates are gonna go down? Because I can guarantee you, at some point you're gonna end up selling the house or refinancing. I just don't know. If you think you're gonna end up selling that house or refinancing within the next three to five years, I'd probably do the 2-1 buy down. But if you are gonna be one of those people that's getting nervous, oh my God, the rate still hasn't gone down. Now it's year three, the rate's gonna go back down, go back up to today's rate, 7%, uh, then that's for the permanent buy down. I just had a client do that. We had a 2-1 buy down, we're closing this week, and she's like, okay, no, no, I wanna do the permanent. I wanna use all the credit. She's getting $20,000 credit from the seller, and we're gonna use the entirety of that to drop her rate. That was unheard of. Yeah. Unheard of. 20,000, they would have laughed in your face. Get out of here. You must be smoking something, yeah. right? You know, but now it's reality. I like, it's happening as we speak. I'm, 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 not, I'm not exaggerating in any way, shape, or form. Before, you have to buy the property as is, and that goes back to our CapEx conversation, right? What about that roof? What about that AC unit? What about that foundation? Before, take it or leave it. That was, you know, I used to do real estate, and that was one of my lines once in a while when was like, people were pressing me. You know, I'll, I'll say, take it or leave it. And then it'll calm down the conversation. So they're like, Ugh. you know, I was like, because I got extra offers. Um, and then now you don't have to pay above appraised value. You can, if let's say you offer 700, but the appraisal comes back at 680, then you have a high chance of getting your, your offer from 700 down to 680, you know, getting a price reduction. And no more bidding wars, right? So that's really good for you guys. Any questions about 
uh, why the market is different and why it's a great time to invest? Yes, sir. And in, in, in that context, you already own the home, or, or are you living in it, or are you renting it? Let's say you buy a house tomorrow. Tomorrow. And next, this time next year, inflation's gone 15%. How is that, is that affecting your property? Is it increasing your property value? Is it decreasing your property value? Does inflation affect it in those regards? I think it would, yeah. Because if, the, if inflation keeps going up, uh, most likely that would result with the Fed raising the rates more. And if they keep raising the rates, it makes it more expensive to buy homes, so that home probably might be worth less because less people are able to qualify for a loan to submit an offer. What your property is worth is what someone is willing and able. See, I, could, I want to buy your $5 million mansion right now. I'm not able to so because of rate, you know, or I don't have the money or whatever the reason, right? So that able and willing part. So if the, if the, if, if the Fed keeps raising it because that's, why, that's what they keep saying. That's what Powell keeps saying. Oh, I'm gonna raise the rates till we get inflation back in order. Well, if it fits 15%, that's not good. No, I don't think that. So, but that's why I wanted to also ask you what you meant uh, or, or what the context was because now, the, now that, would mess, that would make your property worth less. Now, if you are renting it out, you're gonna rent it out for more money because when there's inflation, that means everything goes up including rent. So if you were charging, if you were charging a thousand bucks today, maybe you can char charge eleven fifty next month. I mean uh, next year, you charge more. So you so uh, usually inflation. All right. So he, let me actually uh, go I back. Would say inflation reduces appreciation, right, in the long term, but cash flow is going to be king because of inflation. Yeah. No, I'm going to live there for 10, 15 years. No, I disagree. So before I actually answer that, I, there's another thing I, I, uh, I believe in. So there's, there's uh, usually people are taught there's three types of classes, right? Like socioeconomic, there's uh, lower, middle, and upper. And they, in school, they tell you, hey, you should aim to be part of the upper class, right? Hey, that pays you 300, 400,000, all that. I believe that you don't want to be part of any of those three. You, you want to be part of number four, which is called the asset class, okay? Asset class, because that's the only one that makes you recession-proof. For example, let's say I was a doctor, anesthesiologist, I'm making $500,000. I mess up, I get sued, I lose my license. My 500K is gone. I, I don't make it anymore, right? But, but if I had properties and there's an inflation, the rates continue going, if the rates continue going up, you're going to have more and more people that are going to want to rent from you. Because if they cannot buy, you're either going to buy or you're going to either rent, right? So if you're going to, if inflation keeps going up and, and, um, and it becomes harder, your property actually is going to eventually be worth a lot more because the demand to rent it, the demand to try to buy it is going to be higher because less people, there's, there's a shortage of people that will actually qualify for that, that qualify for that home. So, but my, my thing is if you're buying a house, say you buy a house tomorrow, Yes. And as long as you qualify for it, then yeah. But if I were you, I would try to buy one today and then one tomorrow, one next year. Just keep buying. And then you'd be able to rent it out for more. You know, you hold on to it, have a fixed debt on it, maybe do the two one buy down, hold on to it, and then boom, try to buy another one. Just keep, it's not about timing the market, it's about amount of time in the market. Real estate is not about, yes, if you had a crystal ball, you know for sure that inflation will be at 15%, then if I were you, I would not buy this year, I'd buy next year. You know for sure. And if, you know, but if you don't know for sure and you're okay with holding that property for more than five years, it's a no-brainer. Buy it now, hold on, hold on to it for a long time. It's gonna for sure, especially in the coastal areas where there's a lot of, a lot of diversity industries, it's gonna be worth a lot more. Especially if you guys can buy a house right now 
any construction going on right now is going to be condominiums and uh, apartments. No one's building houses anymore. No one. So if you can own the land, it's, it's going to come at a premium. That's why ADUs are cool because, you know, you can keep your land and just add to it and stuff like that. But yeah, of course, if, if inflation is going to be that high and you have a limited amount of, you know, maybe if you, you feel like cash reserves are not going to be high enough, yeah, then maybe hold on to it. You know, you can get a, a 3%, 5% CD now. Now the banks are finally giving actually interest on your, on saving. Um, and uh, you can, you know, use the next year, but, you know, but what if the rates are now at 10%? It's just, it's just, I don't know. You know, I don't know. I don't know what that's going to entail. Ten more minutes. Okay. Yeah. I'll be. Yeah. And a lot of this. Take a small break, and then we'll have um, Jen start uh, closer to one. Okay. So, so, so this I kind of already covered. Two one buy down. You guys basically start off with a seven percent, then you get a five percent, then a six percent. Any questions about the two one buy down? All right. Cool. Okay. So uh, this is going to segue into the next presenter. Um, let's see. Keep going, keep going, right? Okay. So, yeah, I got lost for a second. I thought, I thought you were your sister. I'm like following your sister. Like, are you coming up here? Okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, credit, okay. Um, so, credit is the controllable, right? So, a lot of kind of going back to the inflation, inflation is the uncontrollables. I don't know. I don't know where it's going to be. I cannot control that. I don't know where the interest rates are. I cannot control that. Uh, I don't know exactly where the prices are. I can't control that. What I can control is house hacking. What I can control is understanding my utilities and my capex, my expenses. What I can control is finding a good tenant that can occupy my property. What I can control is my credit, okay? Credit, the better your credit, the lower your rate. The better programs are available. The bare, bare minimum to qualify for a loan right now is 580, okay? Credit score, 580. Your rate is, as you will see, is significantly higher at a 580 credit score. So today, if you wanted to buy a $500,000 house and do the FHA 3.5% down program, your, uh, your rate would be 7.625, okay? 7.625. And your mortgage insurance is going to be $315, which is just a waste of money. Okay, it just no, it doesn't help you in any way, but that's something that that's something that you incur uh, whenever you use the FHA loan or whenever you down less than 20% down. On top of that, what a lot of loan officers don't tell you is that you have to, you're going to pay upfront mortgage insurance. So look, if you do the math, your loan amount should be 482, but in reality, I forgot to highlight it, your loan amount's going to be 490. It's not even going to be the three and a half because you're going to you're going to pay three and a half into it, but then you have mortgage insurance that you can either add to your closing costs, which, which make your closing costs higher, or you're going to include it into your loan. So yes, you get you you get into the house at 580, but there are extra expenses that happen with that. Okay, so let's look at this other example. 640. So now your credit score is 60 points better. We we drop 0.6 points. Now your interest rate will be seven percent. Okay, and oh, let's look at payment too. And the payment, yeah. Yeah. That's about a $300 difference almost. Yeah, three, so 4370. That's your monthly payment? Yeah. Oh, wait, wait, wait. wait. Technical difficulties. There we go. Okay, now, all right. 4370 compared to 4162, okay, for the FHA. So everything stays equal. You're still paying homeowners insurance, 60 bucks. You have county property tax. Of five hundred and twenty dollars, everything said and done, forty one sixty two. That's a six forty. So two hundred bucks saved for just having a slightly better credit score. Okay, from five eighty to six forty. Then, if you're able to get a seven forty and above, that's the sweet spot for majority of banks. Your rate won't be that that much better. It's six point eight seven five, but your mortgage insurance will go conventional at that, uh, uh, you know, in that direction and you'll get a one, $120 mortgage insurance hit. So now we took you from a 4370, everything's the same, loan amount, all this, we take you from, we take you from a 4370 payment down to a 3830, just because you had better credit. $500 savings. 
I, I don't know about you, but that's, that's a lot. Okay, so that's not my wheelhouse. That's not my expertise. But we got Jen here. She's going to break it down after we after the break, right? Yeah, after the break. Yeah. So I just wanted to share with you how I see things when you guys send me your information, and and I run credit. That's why it matters. Okay, because five hundred dollars that can be a repair. That can be a reserve that you guys put aside. But if not, now that's money wasted on interest. Interest rates are already super high, 20-year high. They can go up higher, right? But what we can control is having our credit score as high as possible. The moment you're at 740, it's as if you have an 800 for majority of banks. Okay, so if you're at 730 or, or even at 700, talk to a specialist, talk to somebody that knows what they're doing, and just get your score bumped up a little bit. It's going to save you potentially hundreds of dollars per, per month you know, in your investment. Okay, and I think that might be everything. Boom! Oh, a little bit about me. Uh, follow me on the gram, Big Surge Money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. tag me. I try to do a lot of like educational videos. Um, as you guys can tell, I'm like super passionate about this. I think that a big thing of happiness is being free. And if you have like multiple streams of income and you're getting cash flow from properties and maybe you have your your stock dividends paying you, you know, different little things, you know, like my, my family, you know, they do a lot of real estate, but my brother's been in the dry cleaning industry for a while, cannabis, a lot of different things they've been involved with. And I just, I just see how free they are and how much time they're able to spend uh, with their children, you know, and it's very inspiring. So I, you know, I, I think a job is super important to build capital, right. And to, and to pursue your passion for whatever job you have, but always try to live beneath your means so you can build up capital and reinvest it into things that don't require your time. At first, an Airbnb will require your time. You got to furnish it, you have to build up those reviews, right? This is not a get rich quick scheme. This is not, it's gonna be easy peasy. But if you're willing to make some sacrifices up front, I promise you 10, even five years, but let's say 10, 20 years, whoa, your life will be so different. I'll leave you with a, my mom's story, very inspirational. Yeah, so I almost forgot my mom and mom. The book, too, the, huh? the, the book you recommended on the immigrant mentality. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was really good, too. Okay, yeah. So uh, my mom, so I, my mom, uh, my mom's story real quick. So a um, little bit about, about me. My dad's from Nicaragua. My mom's from Spain. And uh, my mom, uh, she came to this country. She fell in love with a soldier in Spain and, you know, all that. And then she, she came to this country, and um, she had three kids with her first husband, and uh, didn't speak the language, had no family. And then, you know, she, she, uh, she broke up with, you know, with her uh, husband and then met my dad and, you know, kicked into the curve too. But that's, a lot, that's another story. <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole different story. But, um, but, they, but I bring up all that background because she was all alone, right? She was alone in a country where she had her, her parents weren't, weren't here. Her brother was still in Spain, had no backup. Okay, her back was against the wall. She was she raised my brothers in Section 8 housing. Real, just she's just a real tough lady. Uh, has been through a lot. Um, and to not go into too much detail, she and her and her job. She was like a nurse assistant or something. She never made more than thirty-five thousand in one year. She thinks she only made like thirty, whatever the number is. But now, if you look at her net worth, it's probably close to like five, six million dollars, right? She has a, a big building in San Francisco that we Airbnb, the bottom two units, makes a lot of income. Uh, recently, we, we sold her 23 unit building that she had in Redding, California. She has a lot of property in Sacramento, a lot of property in Georgia. She's actively flipping. She's 72, by the way. She's actively flipping property, all this and that. Um, you know, speaks English, but you know, huge accent and uh, doesn't drive, okay, uh, especially on freeways. So <laughs> has no backup. I oh, mean, now she has me, right? Now she has my brothers. But, but growing up, had no backup, right? Uh, is, a, is deathly afraid to drive on the freeways, right? Does not drive on the freeways. Um, super cheap, like crazy cheap, like, you know, but, uh, but, oh, but what she taught me is you can be cheap and then you guys can tell me with the couch, can I kind of see that influence? <laughs> you know, like my Airbnb will have AC, but my wife and I, we won't, you know, that, that's that kind of mentality where we got to sweat. They don't, they don't have to sweat, you know, but that, that's called the immigrant edge where when you grow up and you got no one backing you up, you're part of a small community 
There's no real Sp Spanish community in, in, in San Francisco. That's why she got with my dad, who's Nicaraguan, you know, you know look for somebody who spoke Spanish, right? Um, you know, you have to become very resourceful and very tough and make something out of nothing. And she started with a small little house in San Francisco, sold that, t took the, 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 the equity that she made, or the, the proceeds from that property, bought the three unit building in San Francisco, needed work, has lived in it since 2001, bought it for 315,000. Who would have known that Facebook, Google, all this stuff would have happened? Now it's worth way over 2 million, has a 180 degree view of San Francisco. But what I want to share with you more importantly is that until 2020, she lived, she lived in the, the bottom part of the building, which she called the rat hole, the real small part where the ceilings are real low. Because why? Because she could charge more rent for the middle and top units that actually have a view and are big and beautiful. I'm not telling you guys to do that, but I'm telling you guys that, you know, I don't know where the economy is going to go, but if you're willing to be uncomfortable, if you're willing to make sacrifices, if you're willing to get creative on how you can create cash flow, because my mom said, I'm, I didn't want the little house anymore. I wanted the triplex, the, the, the unit building, because I'm a single woman. I don't know where I'm going to get income. Like my job doesn't pay me much. I don't have a husband. I don't have, you know, other people helping me. So it made her think, oh, okay, I guess I can't stay in a house. I'm going to get units. And from the unit, she pulled out money and then she bought the 23 unit and did all this other stuff that she did. And she did a lot of this in 07, 06. And then, in, and guess how many properties she lost in 08 and 09? That zero. She lost nothing. She, she, man, Home Depot was after her. She owed hundreds of thousands to, to Home Depot. But she told me, hey, let Home Depot not like you anymore, but don't ever lose a house. Right? So she just, like, just grit, never lost any property, has pretty much always been able to create something out of nothing and never made more than 35000 English was not her first language had no family supporting her, no backup, but she just had her, you know, herself, her, her toughness. And I just wish to be a fraction of as badass as her. That's just the reality of it, man. Big shoes to fill. But anyways, thank you guys for your time. Appreciate it. You guys rock. Um, shout out to Jonathan and Yvonne, sorry. Um, they came to us, what, less than 30 days ago, wanting to buy a property. And their first um, conversation with us was about credit. You know, they were under the impression that by paying off a certain amount of debt, that it would make this huge impact on their monthly credit, on their monthly payment, or on their purchase power, right? Now, so after talking to them, came to find out that it was only going to make about a $30 difference on their monthly payment. So we went from wanting to, initially what they thought was they were going to start shopping for a house after 30 days, right? Once they paid off that debt, the goal was to go shopping for a house. After talking to us, um, we went shopping for a house that weekend. And Steph, shout out to Steph, she was in Colombia, and they actually reached out to her. She was in, in Colombia, and I managed to show them a few properties. And thank God everything went well. We um, have our final inspection today, and we're handing them keys tomorrow. So that's how quickly things, that's how quickly things um, can happen for any of you guys, right? But sometimes I think it just takes meeting the right people um, to guide you in the right direction because sometimes we just lack that information. They didn't know what they didn't know until they came to us, right? So that's how this whole thing came about. And I said, you know what? Let's have a brunch and credit seminar because I think that sometimes people just lack the information. So today, Jen, who is um, Stephanie's twin sister, if you guys can't tell, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that's her twin sister. The younger She's, one. Yeah, the younger one. She's going to talk to us about credit, the importance of credit. I think that Credit is not just good for purchasing a home, it's also gonna be needed for house hacking, right? If you wanna get some sort of credit line to maybe furnish your first um, unit, it's, it, everything revolves around credit, right? And, and it's a credit score that, uh, according to these credit bureaus, they're, they're categorizing you as a A, B, C, or D type of student, right? This is like real life things that most people do not educate you on. So we're going to give her the stage and have her teach you guys about a whole bunch of credit hacks. I think bringing all these things together, I'll wrap it up with a little bit about the ADU strategy so that we just, it all comes full circle. And so where Sergio left off was great because he taught us everything that you can do, but before you get to that house hacking, you need to make sure that you are in a good position with credit. So shout out to Jen. Hi everyone.
All right, it's amazing, right? How much credit can impact your scores, your, your finances. As you can see, Sergio had a great presentation, by the way. Um, showed you guys um, the, the difference between a monthly basis, um, if you have a 640 point score to a 700 plus point score, or 580 point score, right? So you're talking about a $500 difference. On a yearly basis, that's $6,000, right? Now you're talking about a 20, 30 year mortgage. You're gonna be paying 100 to $200,000 more for the same property just because your scores are not at the level where they need to be, right? So uh, my name is Jennifer Cortez. I'm a credit specialist. I've been in credit for going on five years. I'm bilingual in Spanish. So si quieren hablar español, también hablo español. Prior to this, um, I was at State Farm uh, doing life insurance, um, doing future planning like Roth IRAs and stuff like that for 10 years. So I'm pretty well versed as to how you should handle finances, what you guys need to do to get yourself in a position for the next financial goal, right? So my goal is your goal. I wanna educate you guys. Um, from, for the most part, most of my presentations have been over the phone. So I deal with clients over the phone. Um, I do credit repair. So I deal with removing late marks, collections, bankruptcies, um, but also figuring out a game plan. Every one of you guys have a, have a specific scenario, right? Not everybody has that straight algorithm to 720 plus. So we have to look at where you guys are at now, what's affecting you guys' credit now, what you guys can do right now. So some of you guys can already qualify for financing if you guys tweak a few things within the next 30 to 60 days, right? Uh, but other guys, some of you guys may have some negative items in your credit activity. So we can discuss what we can do to help you guys still in those scenarios to get you guys qualified for financing, whether it be a line of credit, a home, a mortgage, a, a car, right? So uh, I'm gonna start with the basics. So what is credit, right? How many guys have challenged, has, have faced some sort of challenge when it comes to credit, right? So most of us yeah. have faced some sort of challenges or have prevented you from qualifying for what you want, right? That best interest rate, that car that you want, that home right now, right? So most of us don't think about credit until it's absolutely necessary. Hey, I think I'm ready. I wanna buy a house right now my credit is not where it needs to be. Now I have to put that on hold for two, six, a year because I didn't financially prep, I didn't prep my credit to where it needs to be, right? So what is credit? So credit is generally defined as an agreement between a lender and a borrower. So it could be Toyota, it could be Chase, it could be a line of credit, right? Uh, it's an individual's ability to pay back their loan. So it's your credit worthiness, right? So think of it as your credit report as your test for the, however long you've been in the credit field, right? Since you've opened up credit. Uh, and then your credit scores are your results from how you've been doing this whole time with paying back your, your payments, your loans, and so forth. Um, so the FICO credit ranges go from 300 to 850, right? So on average, most Americans land in the 700 plus. That's really what you should be if you wanna qualify for the best financing. Not to say that you guys can't qualify at 580. Like Sergio mentioned, you guys can't qualify at a lower, a lower score, but you're going to be paying double, triple than someone who's in the 700 plus, right? So you definitely want to get into the 700 plus. Uh, 800, it's a s exceptional, right? So those who reach the 800 plus usually have an amazing credit history. They have lines of open credit. Um, they have pretty good control over their uh, their finances, right? Uh, these are the three major bureaus that you've probably heard of that render a score. So there's TransUnion, Experian, and Equifax. I like to think of them as retention centers of information, right? They're not liable for what's being reported. They're the ones that retain information, so your payment history for seven years. So anytime a lender wants to look at your credit history, your report card, they're gonna pull your credit from each credit bureau. Okay, uh, now it's very important for you to be aware that these cent retention centers of information only retain information that they're not liable for what's being reported. So a lot of people have a tendency of calling the bureaus and asking them to remove negative items. So that's called a dispute. When you dispute information directly to the bureaus, it just puts them in a position where they have to verify what's being reported against you. And what they do is they go back to their archives and see what Toyota, what Chase reported against you. Verify that information and hit you back with the declination. 
right? So it's not the best thing to just dispute your information. We're going to get into what the best uh, method to remove items is going to be, okay? So what renders a score? What is the algorithm for a good credit score? 35% comes from your payment history, right? So your on-time payments, late payments, collections, these play 35% of your overall credit pie chart. So these payment histories stay on your credit report for seven years. So it's very important for you guys to stay on time with your payment, even if it's just making your minimum payments. I've seen it where one new late payment can bring down scores 20 to 40 points, right? So you definitely want to make sure your payment history is where it needs to be. 30% uh, is balance owed. So over, uh, out of all the credit that you have available, how much of that do you, uh, uh, that you have approved under your name, how much of that is, do you have available, right? You want to keep your credit card balances below 30%. If you start using over 30% of its respected credit limit, so let's say you have a $1,000 credit card and you're using $1,000, it's going to raise a red flag with the bureaus. Just because you get approved for that line of credit doesn't mean you have to use that amount. You have to pay close attention to the usage and keep your balances below 30%. Right? That's how you look like a, a really good risk to, to lenders. If you're using over 30%, it raises a red flag. More, more debt becomes more of a risk. Right? Most people who end up uh, using their credit cards above 80 85% normally do not pay them back. They usually get so overwhelmed with interest rate that it's like they're paying, but they're paying, and it's like swimming against the current. They're not getting anywhere. So you don't want to raise a red flag with the creditors. 15% uh, of this is your credit history. So how long have you had your credit cards? How long have you had these loans? A lot of clients have a misconception of uh, a car loan. They finish paying off a car loan and they think that because of they the finish paying off a loan, they should see an increase in their credit score. But as a matter of fact, it has adverse effects. Sometimes you see a drop in your scores when you finish paying off a car or even a home mortgage, right? And the reason for that is you're losing out on something that was rendering a score on a monthly basis. So this is why it's so important to have lines of credit. Credit cards you can keep open for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and that shows some long history, right? Um, another 10% of this overall pie chart is credit mix. If you have a $500 credit card, a $1,000 credit card, you want to make sure that you have some consistency, some mixture. You always want to have at least two lines of credit at all given times that's going to consistently render a score. But again, you want to keep your, your, your limits, your balances always, always below 30%. Otherwise, it's going to hurt you more than you're benefiting from it. Okay. Uh, and the last one is uh, new credit. So this is something that I always I'm careful. It's a gray area. I always tell clients, you always want to add a new line of credit once every three years or so. Show some activity with your credit. You don't want to get the too comfortable or uh, start applying to multiple credit cards within a short period of time because there's inquiries involved, right? They have to run your credit every single time you're applying. Each inquiry can affect scores one to three points every single time. So you space them out. You don't have to apply immediately right away. Uh, okay. So this is the game plan that I normally tell clients for the most part. If you follow this, you guys for sure guarantee we'll see an increase in your scores, 100%. Okay. Even if you have negative activity, even if you have some unfortunate you know, uh, situations where it prevented you from, from moving forward um, uh, financially, if you keep up with this, your scores will continue to see some growth. Okay. And the biggest one, as you can see in the previous pie chart right here, balance load and payment history. The, the biggest impact that I've seen clients is when they bring down their credit card balances below 30%. Okay. A lot of people say, which ones do, should I pay off first? How do I get to 30%? How do I, which one do I start? Uh, I always tell clients, to me, it's a snowball effect. I always like to bring down credit card balances that are close to 30% first, right? So if I have a $500 credit card uh, and only owe, you know, 300 bucks, I'm going to bring that one down to 30% as quickly as possible, move on to the next one, because now you're gonna have some positive credit cards as opposed to trying to bring all of them down at the same time, and you don't see any of them coming down anytime soon, they're still in the red with the bank. So I always try to get one off, the smallest one first, and it's a snowball effect, work your way uh, to the top. So bringing down your balances is the biggest thing. 
And the next one is keep current on all your payments, even if it's making your minimum payments. That's so important. I've seen so many times people are in escrow, they're already in the middle of purchase, and now they see one late mark that they missed. It brought them down 20, 40 points. Now they're no longer in a position to qualify for that loan, right? So it's very important for you to do that. Uh, have two positive revolving lines of credit or plus. So from experience, I've seen those who end up in the 720s to 800 point score have at least four lines of credit, right? Now there's a trick to this because a lot of people say, I don't wanna have four lines of credit or I don't like to deal with credit cards at all. I'm, just, I'm scared of them, I already paid them off, I don't wanna go back to that, right? And that's fine, but the thing is, you're missing a big piece of your puzzle. That means your, your scores are only gonna get so far, right? So having lines of credit is very important. A lot of couples or parent-child uh, scenarios, I've seen where they add their partner as an authorized user to their line of credit, so they don't have to apply for a new credit card. And the benefit for that is that person that you're adding as an authorized user to your line of credit, they will inherit the longevity of that credit card. So if you had it open for five, 10 years, they will inherit that payment history. If your balances are below 30%, they inherit that at positive activity. So you naturally see a huge boost in scores when you do that. And this works well when they're getting ready to qualify for financing. They say, hey, I don't wanna give my, my child a line of credit or access to a credit card. You can add them as an authorized user. You don't have to give them access, but when they pull their credit information under their social, they're gonna show that they have this credit card under their name. So they have a significant boost in scores. Go ahead. No, nope. like no, I've seen someone say, hey, I have a friend or a roommate who's willing to do me this favor for the next six months to increase my scores. As soon as I qualify, I'm taking this person off. And how quickly would it reflect? 35, 40 days. So that's good, right? Like if you guys were thinking of buying a house in the next six months to a year and you have somebody that you trust and vice versa, they trust you to put you as an authorized user, right? Then now you're preparing yourself for the next six months. What I tell clients is take advantage of this. If you have someone in your household who's willing to add you as an authorized user, especially if, if you're barely starting off in the credit field, right? You're 18 years old, 20, 21, you have no idea what's happening, but you have someone who's willing to help you. Um, they can add you as an authorized user, right, to that line of credit. You now have a great credit history because now you inherit the, this amazing payment history. Now you can go ahead and apply for yourself for financing. Now you have a great history, right, and you can take advantage of that and start applying for your own lines of credit, start establishing your own credit naturally. And that's always really what you wanna do. You never wanna really depend on someone else's credit. That person can have a late mark, can have an excessive amount of credit, and you will inherit that negative activity as well. Go ahead. Uh, does it affect the person who has good credit? No. By allowing no. If you give that person access and that person is now using the account and they're late, then of course you guys are all affected, right? Vice versa, right? So you can always, as much as you can benefit, you can always be damaged by that if that person is now maxing out their credit card, if that person is now late. And you wanna give yourself enough time to remove yourself because you can always do that before the account closes. If the account closes and it has some negative activity, you are now stuck with that for seven years, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a good trick, a good hack, especially if you guys have someone who says, hey, my mom has two credit cards with Amex, 10, 15 years, $100,000, $50,000 limit. You now show like you have that too. Right, so it's it's a it's a really nice hack, uh, but you always want to be careful with that. You still want to naturally grow your own, take advantage of those situations, but still grow your own. Okay. All right. <clears throat> the next one is uh, avoiding adding new debt. Um, oh, I'm sorry. The number four: utilize open lines of credit. Uh, you want to make sure that you you utilize your credit cards. Capital One more so than anyone. I've seen they close your account if you haven't used that credit card for a year. You have you experienced that yourself? Yeah, <laughs> so Capital One is, is tricky. They're really strict. Um, but what, what they tend to do is if you don't use your credit card for about a year, maybe even a year and a half, they will close out your credit card. They won't even let you know. They just close it out. And now you have to reapply, and you lose out on that credit history. If you had it for 10, 15 years, now you lose out on that 10, 15-year history because they decided to close it out. Um, the way you prevent that from happening is using it every two, three months, every once, every six months, paying it off in full, Obviously, don't ever use more than you can handle. Uh, and keep your balances below 10%. That would be ideal, right? The, the way I started is automating my smaller subscriptions, like Netflix, Hulu, and paying it off right away. 
right? It doesn't matter if you have a $500 credit card or 20,000, the fact that you're paying off that debt in full every single month is gonna help you just the same, okay? Uh, avoiding adding new debt. So this is probably the biggest uh, con uh, issue when it comes to, um, uh, when you're in the process of financing a property, right? I've seen so many times where they're already in the process, they've done everything they need to do, they go out and buy a car, right? They, now they, they went out and got a whole new loan, right? So now they mixed out the algorithm that you guys needed to qualify and it puts you away from that, that, that whole process because now you obtain a whole new debt, right? A whole new car. Uh, we're not talking about lines of credit, we're talking about loans, debt, okay? Uh, so more debt introduces more risk and now you have to wait before you qualify for financing again, right? So don't go ahead and get a whole new loan, a whole new car, or, any, or anything like that if you are in the process of buying a house, okay? Uh, so space out the new credit card applications. I think we already discussed that. It adds heart increase to your credit. It's harmful. It stays on your credit for two years. So unlike late, mar late marks, collections, charge-offs, repos uh, that stay on your credit history with the bureaus for seven years, inquiries stay on your credit report for two years. Okay, and they naturally fall off after two years. They're supposed to, by the way. Then it's not always the case. Okay, um, always recommend clients to have some sort of credit monitoring service. Uh, do, uh, does everybody here monitor their credit yes. on a regular basis, weekly, monthly? I check it almost every single day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm obsessed with my credit because I take care of it. I, I know what it takes to get where, I, where I'm at now. Um, and I, I want to say I have an 800 point score plus, right? So I know exactly what you guys need to do to get there, how to take care of your credit, and it's opened up doors for me, right? Uh, applying for uh, and opening up a new business, getting credit cards with cash rewards back, traveling points, all that good stuff is things that are uh, at your table, at your disposal, if you have really good credit. Go ahead. I just have a question. So I remember I tried to buy a house when I was young, like I think I was 23, and I, didn't, I had great credit, but not enough credit. Yeah. So yeah. from my understanding, in that case, if someone was in the same situation that I was in, right, if they were to be added to somebody's credit as an authorized, authorized user but still with no access, it might take up to 40 days for this to take effect, but then they possibly could qualify. Yeah, the Bureau, that. it used to take just 21 days a cycle for creditors to submit information to the bureaus and for them to update pre-pandemic. Since the pandemic, they're taking 30, 45 days. Yeah, lack, lack of, of uh, resources, right? Uh, but yes, if, if you didn't have anything on your credit history and it was just a matter of lack of credit, then this is, this is a solution for that. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead. Uh, what's, the, what's the pros and cons of if you are doing your monthly budget on your credit card, let's say you're doing $3,000 on your credit card and they're using your salary to pay that off by how is that affecting your credit, like utilizing credit in that way? You're going high and then you pay back. Going high. You don't want to go high. You, don't, you definitely don't want to go high. You definitely don't want to use score uh, your credit above 30% because you will see a fluctuation in your scores, right? So if you want to keep your scores steady, you have to also keep your balances steady, right, below 30%. Otherwise, you will see that fluctuation. And there's another thing. I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. There's a difference between your due date and the billing cycle, right? So a lot of times say, hey, I used up, I maxed out my credit card, but I pay it in full every single month. Why is it that my scores are not increasing? Well, it could be that your billing cycle is reporting that higher balance, and then you're making your payment, right? So it could be that billing cycle is on the 15th, and every, every creditor is very different, right? And then your due date is on the 28th, right? You're making your payments on time, but they're reporting that higher balance every single month. So you have to find out what that billing cycle is and pay it before then. I pay it off every single month and I have 800 point score. It's just a matter of utilizing it, right? Uh, utilizing your open lines of credit, keep, uh, keep balances below 10% or paying it off in full. Okay. So you wanna, you wanna use it, you wanna show, because a lot of clients have a credit card and I'm like, I have a credit card, I never use it. Well, you're not really benefiting. What renders a positive score is your payment history, so you're not making any payments. Do you recommend people have auto pay? Yeah, I have auto pay, yeah, for sure. And again, if you have auto pay, you always wanna check. I have clients that say, hey, I had auto pay, I don't know what happened, you know, I, have, I missed two months. 
it's just because in auto pay, you just still don't want to just depend that it's happening every single month. It's your responsibility to make sure it's happening. And there's consistency because once there's a late mark, it's there for seven years, right? And it's hard to remove. Not impossible to remove. That's what I'm here for. But uh, it, it's definitely, it's going to be a, a something, it's, it's rougher and tough to remove something that's within the year. That's something that's over two, three, four, five years, okay. right? Um, yeah. Just to, to take it back off of her yeah. question. Um, so even if I, like, let's say I paid everything down to zero, would I see a negative effect? No. No, because you're making your payments every single month consistently. You're using it, you're making a payment. You're using it, you're making a payment. Now, if you're not using it, there's no payment, right? right. There's, no, there's no history, okay. right? So, we'll talk after. I have <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I need a service. Yeah. <laughs> Ideally, how many payments in a cycle should you make? Like, should you make, like, I always make a payment every 15 days. No, no, because again, overall, there's a billing cycle, what they're reporting, which is your balance, right? Uh, and they report what you paid up till then, not that you made two payments that month, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so no, for me, obviously, sometimes you can pay a little bit extra on a credit card. It's fine if you want to pay it twice that month. Hey, I, I got 30 bucks and then 100 bucks that I'm going to pour toward this, two different transactions. It's fine. It's what they're going to report at that billing cycle that matters, right? Yeah, they're going to see what your credit is. If your limit is, you know, 5,000, uh, and what is your, li your, your balance uh, at the billing cycle? That's what affects you, right? Now, obviously, if you want to pay it off every, every uh, week to bring down that balance, then that's, that's great. You know, you can definitely do that. If your limit's like $10,000 on a credit card and you spend $8,000 but you pay it off at the end of the month, does that affect you at yes. all? Yes, yeah. You're gonna, your scores are actually going to drop. So do and they're gonna. To having them up your, um, yeah, that's actually a good question. A lot of businesses um, have um, a tendency of using a set amount every single month. They, they, that's a set amount that they they, they use every single month. Um, so they don't they can't keep their balances below ten percent. They can't keep their their balances below thirty percent. So in those occasions, yes, what you can do is request for a line increase, mm -hmm. right? Uh, more access. So you still fall below that thirty percent. And they have to check your credit to do that? Or do not all the time. Not, not all the time. That's something you want to ask, and it's at the creditor's discretion. Oh, okay. If you have really good history, like Amex doesn't. They just increase your line of credit. Um, if you ask, ask them, uh, Capital One is a little different. Um, so every... Uh, like the biggest, what about Bank of America? Uh, Bank of America, I think they're lenient. I think okay. they're a little bit lenient. They can actually increase if you talk to them okay. nicely, <laughs> <laughs> gently, Please. say hello, Please. you know. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, uh, the last one is um, optoutprescreen.com. So a lot of clients, um, especially if they're in a tough situation where they're maxed out their credit cards, they're trying to work on bringing down balances. I've seen it to where they finally bring down their credit card balances on a credit card. They had $5,000. They finally brought it down to $2,000. Uh, and they're working their way on bringing down their overall debt, right? But because these creditors um, look at your habits behind the scenes, Bank of America, Chase, all these are checking your habits behind the scenes. A lot of times what I've seen is that as soon as you finish paying down a credit card, they will decrease your line of credit as well. So now you're back to 100% utilization on that credit card. Or they'll close your account. They won't, they won't trust that you can sustain that credit card any longer because they see other activities with other banks. And that's really unfair, right? The credit system is very flawed. Uh, so what you guys want to do is go to optoutprescreen.com, opt out of the system that we're all in. It's free for five years. So it prevents unauthorized credit checks, these pre-approved credit card offers that you guys get in the mail. The tricks, they're not, doesn't mean that you're actually going to get approved. They still have to run your credit to see if you qualify for financing or that line of credit. So uh, it prevents that from happening. If you guys, however, do want to... Uh, run your credit or finance something with your authorization and signature you will be able to pull credit this is just this is just for unauthorized credit checks so it's optoutprescreen.com and again it's free for five years online okay uh so uh, again this is probably one of the biggest things think twice about uh think twice before paying off an old collection or debt i get asked this all the time on closed accounts which one should i be paying off which one should i be focusing on right it's not always the best thing to, to call them up and start making payments. A lot of people say, hey, I want to buy a house. I came across some money. I'm going to call tech. all my old creditors and, and, and pay everything off. I'm done, right? It's not the best decision always. 
because a lot of times the data that you're paying off could be illegitimate, it could be incorrect, right? Uh, the balance might be past the statute of limitation on collecting debt. So every state has a statute of limitation where they can legally pursue you for that debt, right? In the state of California, it's four years. It's one of the most lenient states there is. Nevada is six years, Alabama, I think it's 10 years. So it varies state to state. What that means is that if you are sent to collections, a charge off, a repo, uh, the creditor, original creditor, has that statute of limitation to legally pursue you for that debt, right? And at that point, you are obligated, especially when you take on loans, you are obligated to pay back your loans, right? Um, you now have to pay off that debt, but you have the ability to negotiate the amount. You have, this is why a lot of people go into debt management or debt consolidation because what they do is they advise you not to make any payments so you can be sent into a collection status and then you have wiggle room to negotiate with that creditor. That's something that you guys can do already, right? You guys don't have to work with a credit management or a uh, credit um, consolidation firm. Uh, of course, you always want to prevent from getting there, but if you guys are making a payment on a collection that is beyond its statute of limitation, you are now voluntarily making that payment, okay? Does it mean that it's going to improve your credit score? No, not at all. Sometimes what happens is when you make a payment, the collection company, sometimes it's a third-party vendor, right? It's not always the Bank of America collection. They'll sell it off to a collection company. When you make a payment, that collection company will say, thank you so much for making this payment. We're going to update the bureaus that you've made a payment. But now it reset that seven-year timeline that is on your credit report because it's based on date of last activity. So now you have a brand new collection on your credit report, except now it shows a zero balance, right? So the only suggestion that I would have to pay off a, um, a, a collection is if they guarantee a delete letter, a promise to remove the negative activity when you finish paying it off, okay? And a lot of times people say, hey, I, I, call, I contacted the credit of the collection company. They told me they were going to remove it. Uh, they gave me a receipt. A receipt is not the same as a delete letter. You want to get the delete letter before you pay anything off. Okay. And that guarantees that they will remove the negative activity when they process your payment. The unfortunate part is that this happens about less than 10% of the time. Because in most cases, you, if you have late marks collections, they are truly supposed to be on your credit report. Right? So if you get a pay to delete letter, it's really because the, 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 the creditor decided, hey, I'm going to work with you. I'm willing to take that debt to pay off, uh, to, to take what you owe uh, in return, I'll remove it. But it, it costs them to do so. It costs them legal, legal services to overturn what they reported to the credit bureaus. So not all creditors want to go through that, jump through the hoops to do that for you. Right? That's what we do. <laughs> so we remove that activity uh, for you, okay? Uh, but you guys want to be careful, right? You guys don't, if you guys are deciding, hey, I'm going to pay off this loan because it makes sense for me to pay this off. I want to conduct business with them again. Um, then you, you guys definitely want to get a, a delete letter and do not make a payment unless you get that, okay? Otherwise, it's just going to hurt your credit. It's not going to uh, help you anymore. Uh, so what is credit? So credit is the legal removal of inaccurate and unverifiable, uh, and unverifiable account information from your credit report. Um, the creditors are um, re regulated by a law called the Fair Credit Reporting Act. It's been passed since the 1970s, and it was passed for two reasons. Uh, one, it puts the, the creditors in a position to submit your data to the bureaus with accuracy, validity. Uh, and the second reason is it gives you and I, the consumers, to verify that information, to challenge it, right, to question what's happening. Okay, so that's what, what the credit repair is. How does it work? So what we do here is we send a legal and viable threat to the creditors. We exercise that law, the Fair Credit Reporting Act that governs these creditors. Uh, there's a statute of limitation on collecting debt, right? So we just mentioned how each creditor has a limited amount of time to legally pursue you for that debt. Um, so if we can use that law against them and use that statute of limitation and put the creditors and, and put that burden of proof on them, we've seen that a lot of items get removed because they have no right to legally use their resources to seek for legal help to continue fighting uh, on keeping this information against you. Um, there's the, the Medical uh, Debt Relief Act. So 
there's not supposed to um, be any, any medical related activity on your credit report for six months if there's a late mark or a collection, right, because of the pandemic and all that good stuff. So a lot of uh, medical industries uh, violate this right. So there's a collection that takes place, it's immediately on your credit report. That's not the case. They're supposed to allow you six months to make that payment. And if you make a payment, they are in fact supposed to remove any collection late mark off of your credit report. But there isn't a government appointed police that governs these creditors. So a lot of this information falls through the cracks or they know that there isn't any consequences. So they will still follow and, and put the collection on your credit report because what they want to do is obviously collect, okay? Uh, HIPAA compliance, uh, what we do with the Fair Credit Reporting Act is verify your information, the validity and accuracy of what's being reported. So we need your personal information. HIPAA compliance uh, uh, for the medical industry does not allow them to disclose personal information. They're highly regulated. So it puts them in a bind. So any medical related activity will have a high success in removing because they cannot disclose uh, information, personal information, okay? Uh, and then the CARES Act. The CARES Act was passed during the pandemic from May of 2020, uh, I believe for like a full one year and a half after that. Creditors are not supposed to penalize consumers for late marks, um, uh, collections because of the pandemic, right? So obviously there was still creditor or, or uh, prevent foreclosures from happening during that time. But of course there was still activity appearing. We've seen clients with negative activity foreclosures and, stuff and so forth during this uh, CARES Act time. Um, so we can challenge that and get that removed, okay? Uh, so how long does it take? So some clients can see changes in about 45 to 90 days, right? So sometimes it's just a matter of paying off some, some debt, some line of credit, being as added as an authorized user, establishing, establishing some new credit under your belt. Uh, but in some severe files, if you do have multiple late marks, collections, charge-offs, repos, bankruptcies, uh, it can take four to eight months to get your scores ready to qualify for financing, okay? So I wanna be very realistic. A lot of us wanna buy a house right now, right? We wanna get to the next stage. We wanna add an ADU. We wanna do an Airbnb like now, right? Um, but you have to be realistic. You have to really analyze yourself, see where you're at, see how do you get to level two, three. I'm a gamer, so I'm like, how do you advance <laughs> to the next level? How do you get to that secret passage, you know? And how do you unlock those doors, right? Um, we can guide you. There's, there's definitely tools that you guys can utilize right now. It's, a lot of times it's just lack of knowledge. It's just not knowing what it takes, how does it work. And this is basic stuff. This is not something that you guys are taught in school by any means. I wasn't taught this, I had to learn the hard way, just like most of us had to learn, right? Um, we go out and get credit cards from Victoria's Secret and Foot Locker as soon as we start and then we get into debt and now you're 25, 30, 35 and like, okay, how do, how do I get there? What do I do? I have the finances, I have the team, I have the backup, but my score is not where it needs to be, right? So don't be those people who wait until, hey, I wanna do this to tar start looking at your credit right? Start getting your credit ready for financing now. And in 45 to 90 days, you guys can already be ready, right? So that's really what it takes. Uh, working with us, we do pre-screen every single client. So what we do here uh, as a credit repair is we analyze every client. So we get a copy of your credit report, um, really look at kind of put, putting you on the scale, right? Trying to see where you guys are at and getting a, a nutritionist and telling you, hey, you guys need to do this, you guys need to pay off this, this and this, we will work on figuring out that game plan for you and removing the negative activity, doing the heavy lifting for you guys, right? So we have to pre-screen every client. Um, you have to be in a position to move forward, right? You can't just say, hey, I wanna get into the 700s, but you guys are maxing out your credit cards, you guys are getting loans, you guys are applying for a bunch of stuff. You guys really need to align yourself uh, to get there, okay? Uh, we do offer a complete transparency. So if you guys enroll with our firm, it allows you guys an access portal for lenders, clients, if you guys are teaming, teaming up to see where you guys are in the process, right? Sometimes it can take a couple months. And again, sometimes it can take 45, 90 days. So it's really good so you guys know exactly where you guys are. Uh, we offer guidance and coaching. Everything I just taught to you guys is really brief. My conversations really take about an hour, an hour and a half when I, when I speak to clients. So I love to answer any questions you have, uh, but we do offer coaching. So making sure that you guys are aware, I want you guys to be knowledgeable and never fall into the credit trap, 
right? And when you guys are in the 640s, lower. You always want to keep your scores in the 700 plus, okay? So it's one team and one dream. So all of us are here together to help you guys, um, to teach you guys, and to be here uh, if you guys need us for anything, okay? This is my information. So if you guys have any questions, this is my number, my Instagram, hit me up on Instagram, uh, and my email. If you guys want to reach out to me directly, get some consulting, some counseling, uh, I'll be happy to do that um, over the weekend as well by appointment. But I'm, I'm for you guys if you guys want to call me uh, and consult. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Oh, did anybody have a question? Everybody had a question? Go ahead. Um, is, there, is it a myth to say you shouldn't pay off, some, pay off a loan early? I always hear this conflicting information. You, you really don't want to pay off your loans too early. If it makes financial sense, some clients say, hey, uh, I want to finish paying it off because my goal was use that, those monies for someone else. It's, it's fine. But for the most part, when you get a loan, a contractual agreement, you want to follow through through the contractual agreement. So a, a car loan, you want to, if it's for four or five years, keep it for four or five years. Even if you want to pay it off in, almost in full, but you always want to be consistent with those on-time payments. You don't want to finish paying that off sooner. Well, it's history, right? I'm sorry? For history. No, and, uh, and, uh, well, with the thing is when you take on a loan and you say on the loan, hey, it's going to be for four or five years, when you finish paying it off sooner, banks don't like that. So they keep record of that, right? So you're probably going to have a slightly harder or higher interest at the next loan because they see that you're not abiding by those contracts. You're willing to pay it off sooner. So the banks are not benefiting from you. <laughs> so do you, would you suggest, because I, I was planning to pay off my car next month, but I should have another two years on it. Oh, okay. Well, are you so planning to finance? Like refinance that out and make it a really small payment? You could, yeah. But let me ask, do you have plans to uh, obtain a huge loan within the next year? Um, no, but I want to have that option. Okay, so if you want to have that option, then don't pay it off sooner. Yeah. If you don't have no plans to finance, you can pay it off sooner. You can pay off the car, but you are going to see a drop in scores because, again, that was rendering a positive... Uh, uh, score those on-time payments for however long you've had it. So unless you have solid lines of credit that's going to supplement for losing that, then you're going to see a, do a drop in scores. What I tell clients is, if you have at least three, four lines of credit, I think you're solid. You can you can pay off other lines of credit, and I think you you have a s strong resume, strong background to keep you up. Go ahead. For uh, DTI for qualifying for a loan, you guys, uh, your car payment, you know, uh, student loans, things like that do have an impact, um, but if you get your car payment, for example, down to 10 payments or less, we don't look at it, we don't count it against you as part of your debt. So in deciding whether you wanna pay it off or not, maybe not paying it off in full, but if you were looking to make a purchase next month and you might be tight for your qualification, taking your 24 payments that are left for two years down to 10, now we don't even look at it as part of your debt. So. That's perfect, and that, and that makes sense if you're planning to finance. And if you have a car that's under somebody, well, that's under your name, but somebody else is making payments for, and you can show proof, right, that that other person has been paying for it for the last 10 to 12 months, then the underwriter can look at that and they can exclude that from your monthly debt. So just keep that in mind, too. Does that refinancing affect your credit? Like if you go to refinance something, does that affect your score? Yeah, so anytime you're going to pull credit and they're going to consider you for some sort of financing, they have to pull your credit no matter what. But now you're talking about one credit pool it can affect one to three points because if they run your credit with one bureau, it's one point. All three bureaus is three points. It's not that detrimental to your scores. Mm -hmm. Question, why is it that your score drops, say you stick to that contractual agreement, why does your score drop when you pay off a car? I've always been curious. Yeah, the credit uh, industry is flawed in that sense. You would think that when you finish paying off your car loan, a home mortgage, you're like, great, it shows some consistency. It shows that I'm, I'm able to pay off a car. I should be on to the next stage. I think in the, in the, in the auto industry, they're a little bit more lenient. They say, hey, you've, you bought a car, you paid it off. I think we can trust you with it. Home financing and mortgage are a little bit more stricter. They solely base it on qualifying factors, right? Uh, and your scores drop because the algorithm of the credit bureaus is different in how they render the scores, right? It hasn't changed yet. I wish it changed. And it would give you credit for rent, paying on your rent on time, for utilities and stuff like that, but they don't, right? Um, so what happens is they just use, uh, and, and the purpose of that is they want you to get de into debt. They want right. you to get loans, right? Um, so it's very important for you to have sustaining, active, uh, positive trade lines. 
And you don't want to go ahead and get a whole new loan just to get a, a trade line, which is why it's important to have lines of credit and mixture of that and accessible lines of credit. Mixture of installments and credit lines. And yeah. Does that make sense? Uh, okay. It depends on that person. It depends on the person. Yeah. I personally um, don't like leasing to me, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's up to everybody. Usually if it's a business and you're going to be leasing a car, it might make sense, but it's, it's really up to you. If you're planning to keep that car forever, it makes sense to finance. It's a, a pay to delete letter? Yeah. yeah. Or a, a dispute? It's a dispute. Okay. So let's say you had made an agreement with them to pay a monthly and then you couldn't pay it anymore. How does that affect you and what could you do to help your credit in that? We never recommend to get into a payment agreement uh, into a collect, to a, toward a collection company uh, because what happens is if you agree to that debt, and what happens is um, if you are sent to collections like because you weren't able to pay a debt, you know, they give you a grace period. So during that grace period, it's called a charge off. The creditor is charging it off from their taxes. Is it's a loss, but then they'll sell that debt to a collection company, which is a third party vendor, right? Uh, that collection company is only buying your debt. They can't buy your personal information. So when they contact you and just say, hey, can you verify your information? You're voluntarily providing them with that info, right? So you definitely don't want to do that. Second, um, if you do agree to the debt, you know, and just say, hey, that is me, that's mine, you know, they can now hold you accountable to that debt. And if you're making payments and you stop making payments, they can submit a late mark against you. No, no, because what happens is um, when you're disputing info, it is because you're disputing the debt that's owed, that you're saying, hey, I didn't owe that, or that's not mine, it could have been fraudulent, right? You're disputing a late, hey, I did make a payment, you guys submitted an error, right? Disputing, hey, that's not me, that's actually, I have a similar name to somebody else, that's nothing related to me. So you're disputing that information, that's all you're disputing, you're not disputing, hey, they owe you any sort of debt, right? So when you dispute the information, um, and you really don't want to do that because you can dispute through Credit Karma, through one of those applications, Quick Dis Yeah, There's plenty of cookie cutter letters out there that you can send yourself. But when you're disputing your information, you're asking the retention centers of information. So Equifax, TransUnion, Experian, they're not liable for what's being reported. They're retaining that information. So when you dispute it with the bureaus, all they're going to do is go back to their archives and say, hey, Chase submitted that she was in fact late. So now they're going to come back to you and say, hey, they, they said that you were late. It must be true, right? Because they have to follow the Fair Credit Reporting Act when submitting your data to the credit bureaus. So it's supposed to be accurate. Do we know it's accurate? We have to challenge that, right? That's what we're here for, you know? And even if it's true, we can still challenge it. It puts the, we have to put that burden of proof on the creditors. And by law, they only have 45 days to seek for legal representation, to respond to uh, any sort of challenge. Um, and if they can't respond within 45 days, even if they are yours, by law, default, they have to remove it off your credit report legally and permanently, never to come back again, right? Um, but yeah, disputing, it doesn't really work. Millions of people dispute on a, on a daily basis, and it goes through an automated system. So it has to be a little bit more aggressive um, to get that. And if you do have someone on the line and you say, hey, I'm, I'm willing to uh, make a payment, then you want to get that deletion letter. Otherwise, you're making a payment, your scores are going to drop, and now you have less money that you could apply toward paying down a credit card, right, or a down payment. So in accordance to what I was kind of referring to earlier about, um, you know, them owing you, I meant is there anything that they do illegally that you can... Um, Challenge and, and win yeah. as in a lawsuit? No, not necessarily. Uh, what happens is um, through the Fair Credit Reporting Act, they have to follow that set rule of guidelines. So if they miss that, the default is to correct it and remove it. Now, you as a consumer, if you say, hey, I wasn't able to qualify because of that reporting years back, you can seek for legal help to sue the original creditor for doing that. Yeah. Obviously, we don't want to recommend that, though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
it's, it's call a, Jen at that yeah, point. just call me and we'll get that fixed and get your scores to where you need to be. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? We're good. Good? All right. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you.